Imagine going back to the house where you grew up. With everything inside exactly as it used to be. Some familiar faces are going to do exactly that. Oh my god, I'm back in the 70s. This week, Boy George confronts his past. So funny how like a simple thing like a picture, that is, I just remember that. But it's not a set, is it? It's not a movie. It's a real thing. All my attempts to not be like my dad have failed because I am basically a gay version of my dad. Round to the left, kiddo. Mind that bus. <laughs> Since the 1980s, Boy George has had number one hits in more than a dozen countries, and his albums have gone platinum ten times. Over the years, he's also made headlines for addiction and arrests. A lot of my life feels like it happened to someone else. Whether it's the success I had with the Culture Club, or even things like going to prison, it really feels like, did that happen to me? For the first time in over 30 years, he's going back to the house where he grew up in southeast London. I think it's going to be a really interesting experience for me. I would never dare go and knock on the door and say, oh, I used to live here, can I come in? I would say that I'm in a kind of transitional period in my life and in my career. There was a time when I really just wanted nothing to do with the past. The biggest change for me is that I got recovery. You know, and you put as much effort into staying sober as you did into getting wasted. What happens is that you start remembering stuff. Yeah, this is all becoming very familiar now. A bus stop, many a miserable hours spent waiting there for a bus. Here's my hideous school. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. George Allen O'Dowd grew up on the Middle Park Estate in Eltham. Well, it just seems a bit posher now. <laughs> it seems posh. <laughs> Built in the 1930s, it was part of a massive wave of housing construction during the interwar years that gave rise to 4.3 million new homes nationwide. Everyone knew everyone's business, you know. Everybody had the same sort of curtains. These houses had three small bedrooms, outside toilets and no central heating. They were typical of the council houses of the time. My friend Boyd used to live in that house over there. He had all, he was sort of like this guy, he used to have loads of records. My aunt, my, sort of, we used to call my aunt Heather, used to live next door there. There used to be, um, I think she was a hooker, called, we used to call her Dracula. We used to live in that house with a sort of darker brown door. I knew the people that lived here, they were really nice, they were an older couple. Um, there was just loads of me, it's just really mental to be here again. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> they weren't here. Shh. <laughs> Number 29, Joan Crescent, was George's home until he was 14 years old. Using personal photos and family testimony, the living room is the first place that's been taken back to exactly how it was in 1971. Seeing the forgotten past brought back to life can have a profound emotional impact. And this will be the first time George has set foot in this house for 35 years. <laughs> so funny how like a simple thing like a picture that is so funny because that's i just remember that and that uh... oh my god it's so mental and the wallpaper remember that i just feel like wow oh swan vestas <laughs> number six. Oh my god 
you know, can you imagine, like, all the people who used to smoke in this room? Really, like, toxic cigarettes. Just awful. Who lived here? My mother and father, Jerry and Diane. And my brothers, Richard, Kevin, Gerald, David, me, and my sister, Siobhan. All in this little house. Mental. <laughs> mental. Absolutely mental. The O'Dowds were a large Irish Catholic family. George's mum had moved from Dublin to London after becoming an unmarried mother. It was here she met her husband, Jerry O'Dowd, a builder. George's father died in 2004. What's right is the kind of mood of this place. I mean, I just remember it was full of smoke and anxiety and screaming and, you know, all sorts of unpredictable things. I wouldn't say that it kind of conjures up feelings of happiness, you know, at all. I mean, my dad was a really extreme person. He was quite explosive, quite violent sometimes. And I remember my dad kind of shouting and saying, this is my ass. He had a lot of that, you know. I remember my mum had her first driving lesson from this house. My mum would kind of come out and it's quite nice, you know, smart outfit to go in for a first driving test. And my dad had kind of lost it and accused her of having an affair with the driving instructor she'd never met. And my dad chased the guy down the road, so the guy left his car on, on, on the grass and ran down the road and, and sort of wouldn't come back until my dad had calmed down. So this house brings back all those memories for me. But the thing that really contextualises this whole room is this picture. Sort of weeping baby. Which said a lot about what was going on at the time, really. It's much nicer outside. Let's go. <laughs> Come on. But you were so looking forward to coming in here. I know. It's such a shame. <laughs> I was expecting something very different. And I was really nervous about it, you know. But it's, um... Yeah, it's made me quite emotional. Come on, let's go. See you later. Although George's home has been taken back in time, some important items from his past are missing. Over the next few days, he'll track them down and explore what they meant to his life. But the following morning, George is having doubts. And how are you feeling about going back there today? Are we going back there today? To where, though? To Joan Crescent. Oh, I um, believe we're going back there. That's not going to make me very happy, I have to say. Not because I don't want it, it's just I've, we've done it. It's like, why am I going back to the house? Stop filming this now. This one is a very famous house because Boy George lives here. Sometimes it's completely covered with Boy George, we love you, and I love your music, Boy George, and they have, have to clean them every day. Wow. Boy George is taking a trip back in time to explore how he became the man he is today. Right, come on. Leave! It's been an unsettling process, but he's going to continue. His teenage home has been recreated, but some important items are missing. He's seeking them out to explore how they shaped his life. Music journalist Charles Shah Murray has something George hasn't seen in over 30 years. Check this out. George's very first record player. There's one there's ones you piled them up, right? Yeah, it was the nearest you could get to, to doing a mix in those days. You could stack up half a dozen singles, yeah. and that was the only way you could choose a sequence of music. And that was the same records over and <laughs> over again. And remembering my mum banging on the ceiling with a broom to turn it down. I think with this ancient technology, 
You had a kind of physical relationship with the bit of plastic that carried the music. I mean, yeah. now music is phantom. It's bits and bytes and yeah. you something you download and it's on your computer or on your iPod. And it's not a physical thing that you hold in your hand. And I think that almost affects the way you relate to the music itself. Yeah, and also escape. Escapism. It was a gateway into a magic world, though, wasn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, It's like yeah. having a little TARDIS in your bedroom. You know, especially if you had the right records, that was perfect for escaping domestic <laughs> trauma and <laughs> the grimness of suburbia. Well, I think this is about to set off on its travels. So... Listening good health, George. Thank you very much, Charles. Enjoy. <laughs> nice to meet you. And you, once again. <laughs> It's heavy. <laughs> now, now, now I know why we don't have these anymore. <laughs> George's record player was made in the 1950s. It was given to him by his dad, who'd found it whilst clearing out a house he was rebuilding. <laughs> Now, the sound quality is appalling, but I probably would have, would have noticed that back then. As George got older, there was one person that he looked to for inspiration. Get ready, welcome to hell. <laughs> His big brother, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> Coming to your worst nightmare. Ooh, lovely. <laughs> oh, God. How small is this room? I can't remember it being this small. How the hell did we live in this tiny space, six of us? Oh, do you know what? I really it don't know. Really... It is so weird. Everything is unbelievable. Richard had followed their dad into the family building trade and had the money to buy his own records. Well, well, all the drag on. What's this, Rod? That's Rod Stewart. Every picture tells a story. He was a real Rod freak. And Richard used to have the hair and everything except the Rod Stewart hair. <laughs> Bit of a long intro and all. Throws everyone at a concert. I remember Richard went to see Rod Stewart in the faces at Lewis Modian. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Followed yeah. him. <laughs> I remember it was all like. Can I come? No, fuck off. <laughs> it was like... It was also through his brother that George discovered someone who'd changed his life. So I remember hearing this through Richard's door. <laughs> My age went off ahead. Hit some tiny children. <laughs> weird, but it's weird listening to it The black had not have balled her off. I think she would have killed the killer. Soldier with a broken arm. Fix the stair to the wheels of a Cadillac. This is a lot. Cop knelt and kissed the feet of a priest. And the queer flew up at the sight of that. <laughs> Just those lyrics, yeah, I mean, because there really wasn't anyone else making records like that, was no, there? No, no, no. No one really made a record and you could listen to it and think, you know, what the hell was that all about? See, I was the opposite. I used to think I knew what it was about. <laughs> Would you do this when you were kids? No, not at all, no, because he was, like, kind of a few steps ahead of me. Yeah. So I'd get the kind of... I'd get thrown a few things, like a bit of a pair of battle platforms. Like, if I bought well, a record... cool to hang out with your young brother. No. I mean, I remember when I was working on a job, a mum phoned me up um, and said, like, oh, have you seen George in the paper? And I remember opening the Daily Mirror, and I didn't know... I mean, I didn't know you'd sort of changed your look and done what you was doing. So anyway, I got back to the job, and uh, there was a couple of lads there who knew me, and one of them's gone, is that your brother? And I went, no, I said, that ain't it. And I said, it's another bloke called George O'Dowd. And I thought, well, I don't want all the blokes on the site knowing you're my brother. 
people find it hard to grasp that you that you ain't uh, you know you're not in in character all the time. Yeah. But we all know when you get a little bit moody and a little bit umpy, <laughs> to leave you alone. You're getting into your boy George character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, he didn't realise we knew that. <laughs> I think what happens, when you become famous, with all the best intentions of the world, you think, oh, I, I won't change, I'll be normal, you know, I'm just going to be the same person. But when people start treating you differently, you do change. Yeah, you're up your own arse, definitely. I think up until just a few years back, you didn't appreciate what you had and what you'd done. And I think that's why you sort of went a bit off the rails, you know what I mean? Personally, myself, I wouldn't swap my life with your life. Yeah. Well, you're no good at woodwork anyway, or hanging <laughs> doors, are you? You know what I mean? So you'd be, you, you'd be out, you'd be unemployed. <laughs> right, give me singles back, I'm off. Oh. What's the time? I might go back to work. So, oh, are you going to go back to work? I'm fit in the kitchen. <laughs> George's four brothers followed their dad into the building trade. Right, see you later. See you later. Bye. But George was set on a different path. Ziggy played guitar, jamming good with Weird and Gilly and the spiders from Mars. David Bowie grew up in the suburbs of Bromley, just four miles away from George. But his creation, Ziggy Stardust, was an alien rock star from another galaxy. I kissed his hand! I kissed his hand! I went, oh! Oh, oh it's lovely! <laughs> We're just him crazy. He's fantastic! Oh, to this day, Bowie remains one of the top ten biggest selling British musicians of all time. Didn't know what time it was and the lights were low. I leaned back on my radio. Some cat was laying down some. Get it on, rock and roll, he said. In the days before MTV, Top of the Pops was one of the only ways young music fans ever got to see their idols in action. It was the cultural event of the week, attracting audiences of 15 million, twice that of Coronation Street. Bowie's 1972 appearance has gone down in pop history. When Bowie came along, it was like, he made it OK to be a freak. He said he was bisexual, which was really shocking. He was like, oh, my God. So it was like, I remember it once, and, you know, just so many things, and going to school the next day and everyone talking about it. Let the children lose it. Let the children lose it. And children lose it. And children lose it. By 1972, homosexuality had been decriminalised for just five years. Bowie only put his arm around his guitarist, but the gesture caused outcry. I mean, a lot of people kind of slagged off Bowie for saying he was bisexual when he really wasn't. But I just think what he did was so powerful for gay people at a time when nobody was doing it. I wouldn't be the person I am without having discovered Bowie. No, of course, it, it shaped a lot of my life. Let the children use it. Let the children use it. It was very easy to look back and rewrite history. Say, oh, well, I knew what I wanted to be, and I knew I was going to be famous, and... Because I didn't. I think when I was a kid, you know, I knew I was different. I knew I was weird. People told me I was odd, and I got called names all the time. At home, at school, everywhere. So I knew I was an outsider, you know. And then when I was a teenager, I kind of wore the uniform of an outsider. And then, you know... Later in my teens, it was when I started... I mean, I'd always loved music, and I'd always kind of wanted to be loved, I would say, not, not famous. I would say I wanted to be loved more than fame. And I suppose I associated being famous with being loved. Teenage George spent every moment of his spare time listening to music, but his father and brothers had a very different passion. Boxing ran in the Odell blood, and Dad's ambition was to have a family of fighters. Do you remember these? Hey, Dad! He used to take us in the back room and get us all sparring together. Ooh. Only George's younger brother, Gerald, went the distance and became a professional boxer. The boys have come back to their old club. When I was a kid, this would have been a totally intimidating environment for me. I remember my dad kind of 
bringing me. Usually, I was quite good at, you know, I'm listening, to, listening to me Barry <laughs> records, I'm counting me jewellery, I can't come, but I got dragged here. Yeah, but it was Dad's passion. It made him light up when he talked about boxing or if you was interested. It was almost like as if you were doing all the things he, he couldn't didn't yeah, do. Yeah. And the reason I came here was because I was playing football and Dad said... <laughs> and Dad said... <laughs> <laughs> and Dad said... It, <laughs> he's got a good punch in him, actually. And Dad said it, it'd be good training for you. What I've realised, he was a product of his time. You know, Dad had a bad temper. Um, and you had to you had to watch yourself sometimes. You know, but then you know he'd lose his temper over something really trivial. Do you remember what he did to David? He, yeah. he knocked him out. Yeah. Over yeah. Uh, David had got a letter, and, and he said, "Well, what is it?" And David said, "Well, it's mine. It's nothing to do with you." And he just knocked him sparko. Yeah. I just remember kind of standing up to him a lot. You know, uh, kind of thinking. Listen, I, I mean, hope he doesn't hit me. I can, re <laughs> I can remember. I can remember you standing up to him and, and just... think thinking, you keep your mouth shut, do you know what I mean? Cause... No, no, that was, that was never really, I was never good at no. that. See, the thing with me, although I'd spent all of my life kind of trying to be everything that Dad wasn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I ended up being the most like Dad. Really? That thunderous ability to blow off and then, want a cup of tea, that was yeah, Dad, yeah. wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it, that's exactly what it was like. The last time I ever really kind of reacted like that was with Michael, my ex-boyfriend. Yeah. And then we had this massive fight, and I remember stopping and going, oh, my God, you know, what am I doing? Yeah. And I remember saying, this is my house, and it was a real classic father mm. comment, yeah, it's my fucking house. Mm. All my attempts to not be like my dad have failed, because I am basically a gay version of my dad. I suppose, you know, when I went to prison, it probably got me through that because, you know, I'm not yeah. some little, you know, wallflower, yeah. despite the kind of way I look and the makeup and stuff. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh my God, I'm with all these ruffians. I mean, I kind of grew up in a yeah. quite boisterous family, so. And you didn't take shit from anyone? No. No, you didn't. I didn't. I mean, and, and I think that definitely comes from my dad, yeah. Do you ever draw any parallels between your father's violence and your own life? Of course, yeah. I mean, you know, if you've learned as a kid that the way to sort of deal with an argument is by screaming or throwing something, then it becomes kind of normal, of course. So, yeah, there was a point for many, many years where my relationships, I thought they were great relationships because they were really extreme and volatile and emotional and, you know, always kind of fighting. And I thought that was kind of what love was, absolutely. <laughs> Spending time with his brothers is giving George the chance to think how his family background influenced him. After talking to Richard and Gerald, he's meeting his other two brothers to see what they remember. Oh my God, back to hell. Hello. <laughs> Joining George for dinner are Kevin and David. So what do you reckon? Hideous, isn't it? Right. I think we've all got a bit bigger, that's what I reckon. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think it's, it's just... No, it's tiny, man, isn't it? It's incredible. Tiny. Okay. Right, Kev? Oh, both, sorry. That's all right. In the 70s, food was pricey, taking up twice as much of the family budget as today. Those stews, I mean, the thing is, oh, wow, look at that. Proper stew. And George's mum had to feed a family of eight. This is like a luxury version of what we used to have. <laughs> Do you want some, Kev? Yeah, cool. yeah. I do remember the food that we ate was fill them up and shut them up food. You know, you ate what you were given. Yeah. Now, we had kind of off-cuts, wasn't it? Off the bone. No, there was, no, off the bone, that's posh. <laughs> <laughs> there was a thing in the butchers you could get sort of, not dodgy Scrag meat, in, but... Scrag ends, that was it. <laughs> I remember, if I'm not mistaken, you, Kevin and Richard, helping yourself to more than what you paid for at the local supermarket. When oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. You used to do one thing that you didn't realise you were smothering, but like, what you used to do is you used to walk around in your own things, whistling and singing to yourself, and everyone would be going, oh, there's that mad kid, right? And while he was doing that, I was just loaded up with chops and, like, bits of cheese, big lumps of cheese and things like that. I remember stuff. there used to be, you know, the guilt trip of handling stuff you hadn't paid for <laughs> and then getting on with eating it. That I remember was what it was, wasn't it? going for the shopping and knowing that the ten shillings was all she had. And... You know, I don't feel guilty about stealing things like that. But my mum used to go without food, I knew that. Mm. I knew she used to go without her food. I actually have always liked being in a big family. I just remember a lot of laughter. You I know? think each generation, you know, it's like, I think Siobhan's experience is totally different to our experience, mm. you know, of here. You, or... you, Kevin and Richard certainly had it harder than me, Gerald and Siobhan. Mm. That's for sure. 
1974, the family left this house and moved to a new neighbourhood. Now, George is leaving his home again. My first day here was quite uncomfortable. Today hasn't been too bad. I think having other people to bounce off has made it a bit more of a pleasant experience, but I am looking forward to never coming here again. This is a very unusual situation. You don't allow for what effect it's going to have on you. You think, oh, yeah, I'm going to come back to a set. But it's not a set, is it? It's a real thing. Lovely. In 1974, the local authority moved George and his family out of the council estate and into this Edwardian semi-detached house three miles away. What was the neighbourhood like around here compared to Jane Crescent? Well, very difficult. We didn't... <laughs> Did he call me a bender? <laughs> <laughs> Always brave, yeah. He was cute as well. Um, I moved here when I was 14. And when we first got here, we couldn't believe this was the house because it was so huge, it was massive. It was like a palace. And it was just very exciting, you know, it was change. Again, before someone else calls me a wanker. <laughs> the second of George's homes has also been taken back in time. <laughs> They're mental. In the 70s. <laughs> Great wallpaper. Yeah, the wallpaper's dead spot on. See, this is much better. This is much better space. These are so cool. I had a big obsession with mirror tiles in the 70s. <laughs> Mm. It's great. By the mid-70s, George's dad's building business was flourishing and more money was being spent on the home. On the phone, there would have been a lock. Obviously, there was a big lock on this. But we found out that you could actually pick it up and do, like, eight... eight, five, three, do it like that. And it used to work. It used to get through to people without using the dial. But actually, I don't know how we survived. There was no mobile phones. You only had pay phones. And most people, to start with, didn't have phones in their house. But back then, it was like, you made an arrangement and you had to keep to it. But this house, just, you know, nothing but kind of positive memories from this place. And also, it was a big shift when I moved here. I had a massive fight with my dad in this house. I ran up the stairs to escape him. I went into the bathroom and locked the door. My dad literally put his fist through the bathroom door. And I was like, it just went poof, came off the head. He was like, first of all, he was like, come out. And I was like, no, I'm not coming out. And then literally he just went poof, and the whole door came off. Can you imagine how terrifying that was? So I ran for his legs. And I, as I ran for his legs, I tripped and I fell down the stairs and hit my head on the radio, so it was, a, it was a really small little cut, but it just bled. You know, it was like the exorcist. <laughs> I just remember kind of, I was like, oh my God, and me just looking up going, look what you've done, and running out of the house. No shoes on. <laughs> I went to my friend's house, and I stayed away for about, about seven days, I didn't come back. But I kind of, I knew that that was the last time. It was the last time I'd ever have a fight with my father and I'd made my mind up. So that was really significant in this house. That day, I remember thinking, I've grown up. This is when my mum came to sew. Sewing machine is missing from this room. <laughs> To find his mum's missing machine, George has travelled to a craft museum in South London. What 
a mad place. Hello. It's so mental. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> How are you doing? It's like snow machine heaven, isn't it? Isn't mad? it? Expensive. Yeah, no, it is. He's been joined by a fashion historian, Paul Gorman. So you're here to find a particular object which you will recognise. And is oh, it... there is, that the blue the... one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey! And so what was the first thing you had? I could have swore on? it was a singer, but obviously I'm wrong. But yeah, no, I recognise this. And what did you have made on it? Oh, God. You see, my mum had a habit when I came home with things, I could make that. So I would say, go on then. Right. Well, and she would? Yeah, she would. And you just joined the queue, you know, she was all making curtains for someone, so I used to give my mum, like, sort of chair covers. Oh, yeah. And say, make me leggings. And, yeah. <laughs> but one of the most spectacular things she made were these kind of spotty dungarees. This massive, great big oh, legs. there's a picture of them in here, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, with big black and white spotty dungarees. They were quite a triumph. I think the thing about that time, particularly the early 70s, was that fashion was somewhere up there. And oh, yeah, if absolutely, you were a 12, 13-year-old pop fan... You couldn't dress like pop. You could kind of hint at it, but you could never really be Bowie. Which is why we went to Oxfam shops, jumble sales. Jumble sales were yeah, enormous. Yeah. I've always thought that it came out of that kind of post-austerity thing, because if you think about most of our parents, they came out of that generation, which was really made to amend. They had to sometimes make their own clothes or copy or make things last. And I think we as a generation, in a way, benefited from that because we grew up with that all around us and so everything was possible. Last used that uh, sewing machine for oh, you. Well, I think she upgraded it at some point. Home sewing was huge in the 70s and almost 5,000 machines were sold every week. Today's recession has reinvigorated the DIY trend and sales have gone up a reported 500% in the last two years. George is heading back to his old home so that his mum, Dinah, can put her old sewing machine to the test. I know how much you love doing these. I love stuff. Hair box femme trousers. <laughs> you to tart up. <laughs> what do you want me to do oh these God. for you? Look at this. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. George and his mum have always had a very close relationship and still speak almost every day. That's going to be crooked, eh? Yeah, so it's not going to be fantastic, I'm afraid, right? That wouldn't have been acceptable. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. I mean, there were times when I'd kind of get mum to make something and I'd be really, like, waiting for it to be finished so I could wear it. Hot from the bakery, <laughs> like, come on! <laughs> I learned so as a child up in the playground that we used to go to. And on Saturdays, the lady came and showed us how to knit, sew and darn. Well, I remember, actually, you made these Vivian Westwood bondage trousers. I don't know if you made a pattern or not. Did no, you I did, no, I didn't. They had to be quite wide to, um, to put the zips in. So the only thing I, I, I the pattern I used was a pyjama pattern. I actually got collared by Vivian somewhere. Yeah. In the, in, the, in the late 70s. Oh, yeah, where'd you get She them? marched up, she goes, I never made those. And I said, no, no, you didn't. My mum made them, and so she had a good old look. You know, yeah. Sort of no, they did, they didn't really turn well out... Made. She was they quite impressed. Yeah, they didn't turn out too bad, yeah, actually. Good. I wouldn't have worn them if they weren't authentic. I mean, I loved clothes. I couldn't wait to get my wages when I was a girl. I think oh. if you look at early pictures of you, there's a lot of fashion going on. Bit yeah. of a princess, wouldn't you? Yeah. I did buy a dress once, and it was a paisley design, and your father came in and he went, well, you're not wearing that, it's too short. Do you remember? Yeah, there was a lot of that. And I tore it up. Oh, really? Yeah, I ripped it. In a way, because Dad wouldn't let you dress up, that's why you quite liked me dressing yeah. up. It was almost like I was doing it for her. That was the great thing about you and I, from when you were about 14, when you told me that you were gay. And, because uh, I didn't know anything about gay people, I didn't know anything about the mechanicals. And I said, so, well, what do you mean, what do you mean? <laughs> and you did say, you know, I don't like women, I like men. And I went, well, I'm not going to shout at you. And, and do you think I'm going to throw you out? And you went, I don't know. And I said, no, I'm not. I think that moment I became more protective of you. George's new home was bigger, but it still only had three bedrooms. From the age of 14 to 19, George shared a room with his two younger brothers. This is the final room that's been transformed. Oh my God. 
this was my bed. I think there were a few fights about this position, but I got it. The only thing that's missing, why are there no pictures on the wall? This would have been covered in pictures. But yeah, I definitely need to decorate this fucking room. It's awful. <laughs> Got to give it some personality. George is in central London. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in love. <laughs> He's visiting a vintage store to find some of the old magazines that are used to decorate his bedroom walls. And for a teenage boy like George in the 1970s, there was one favourite publication. These are obviously girls' magazines, but I used to buy them. There might be the latest picture of Bowie from Japan, or occasionally I'd find an unknown celebrity that I fancied that they'd go on the wall. <laughs> First published in 1964, Jackie was an instant hit and remained the biggest selling teen magazine on the market for the next 10 years. We would quite like to, you know, these young chaps here. Young David Essex was gorgeous. Do you know what? I don't really remember boys' magazines. I mean, I'm sure there were some, but they weren't of any interest to me. I didn't sort of, you know, look for... And with the soccer annuals, wasn't there? It was all sort of soccer annuals, um, bubblegum cards, you know, not... It's something that I would even gravitate towards. I was always like, look, see, that would have been what it was all about. <laughs> that would have been worth buying Jackie for, that picture. I even had a Shawaddy Waddy poster up once. I don't know why. I do know why, but I'm not going to say. <laughs> well, I found this Shawaddy Waddy poster and they all looked like they had really big knobs in it, so I put it on the back of my wardrobe. <laughs> And I did also have a poster of Shake and Stevens for a while as well. I did have a bit of a crash on Shakey. <laughs> on his way back to his teenage home, George makes a detour. Very famous building. <laughs> Probably would have been in 77. I met a man on the tube, <laughs> an Italian. And um, I was invited to a party here when I was a punk. I actually lost my virginity here. <laughs> In this place. <laughs> I was... Vaguely 16. <laughs> Maybe not 16. I was all... I think I must have been 16 because I was at work. Was it safe sex? Well, I mean, the thing is, this was, like, in the 70s, so there wasn't really any kind of panic about that when we were kids, you know? Safe sex really only came about when AIDS came about. So I think it was probably up there or somewhere. It's a shame we can't go inside because it's a very beautiful flat. But apparently it's now owned by Opus Day, so <laughs> a religious organisation. So apparently they don't want us in there. They should have a plaque here, shouldn't they? <laughs> this is where boy George lost his cherry. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> Quality. Yeah, no, that would have been a real prize. George has returned to his 70s bedroom in Shooter's Hill to finish bringing the room back to life. Very cool. Aside from his Jackie magazines, there was another place where George went to look at men. <laughs> Well, here we go. Let's just swim in trunks. Doesn't really excite me now, but it would have done. It's very heavy, so I'm gonna have to get down. Oh, oh my God. Most gay boys in the 70s fingered through their mother's catalogues, because, you know, a lot of stuff was bought on catalogue. And we would have gone straight for the pants section. I mean, that's, yeah, it's pretty raunchy. I mean, it, Obviously now it's, you know, <laughs> it doesn't seem so exciting. But these kind of shots would have been quite nice. Because <laughs> there wasn't anywhere else to kind of see semi-clad men, so catalogues were quite a good place. <laughs> you know Mum's catalogues? <laughs> I lost my virginity to it. Come have a look, they don't look so kind of attractive anymore. <laughs> I, I mean, guess. I don't know if this is the best, oh, this, I don't know if this is the best of the catalogues, but obviously 
<laughs> not so not so sexy. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't that page either. Tragic. But, so it wasn't no. just a gay thing. It was. No, no, no. Straight no, boys no, did it as no, well. No. They went straight to the bra bits. Auntie Jen uh, supplied the catalogue. Let's have a look Mark at what Bo you may have bought. Yeah, look, on Mark Bowler, he would have. Remember, I would have exactly. been very selective about these I things. I don't think we could have afforded blue tack, I'll be honest. It would have been sellotape, wouldn't it? Been sellotape. <laughs> Bit wonky, Dave. Bit of rod. That would never have worked, look. That's exactly how Richard had his hair. Yeah, well. Richard looked just like him. So what kind of posters would you have had? I had Trevor Brookin. Who's he? Trevor Brookin's a footballer. Oh, right. <laughs> um, I don't think you fancied him. <laughs> no, no. But yeah, that, we just. I can't. What did you have? You had some. I was here, and I think I probably would have had Farrah Fawcett Major. How did she not cope with privacy in here? What was that like? Well, George had privacy because their wardrobes were like that. Wasn't their wardrobes in the It was this, gap? but it was there. I think yeah. it was. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So I didn't really know what you got up to behind there. Nothing. <laughs> um, maybe a couple of times you, you brought some people back. <laughs> no, I never had sex in this no, house. No, 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 no. You brought friends back, and they stayed. There was an incident with David. He'd obviously had a girlfriend in here, right? And he'd left the evidence on top of my hat. Oh, he did? Mum said, is that your French letter upstairs? And I said, as quick as anything, I haven't had any post. And she looked at me as if he hasn't got a clue what he's talking about, and then hit him. <laughs> <laughs> and he was going when George was a teenager, the age of consent for gay sex was 21. Aged 15, George was stopped at Heathrow Airport by the police. When they discovered he was waiting to meet a boyfriend, he was arrested. At this point, his dad was the only member of the family who didn't know George was gay. I just remember George coming in and going straight upstairs and then Dad was explaining to Mum what had gone on. And, you know, you were really angry, do you know what I mean? Because you were... I'd been really mistreated by the police. Yeah. They kept calling me names and yeah. letting me fall asleep and then waking me up. Yeah. They were trying everything they could to get me to give the name of this guy that I was mm. meeting. But I remember the conversation where, George, you were kind of standing in your corner. And Dad was, in a way, he wasn't being nasty. He was kind of trying to, you know, he was worried. You were saying, this is not something I'm going for. And I clearly remember you saying, no, I'm gay, I'm gay. And I remember Dad saying, you're not gay. And you said, I am gay. And he said, you're not gay. And you said, I like cock. <laughs> and I, I, I remember really? clearly getting under the duvet <laughs> and trying to hold my breath because Dad was quite, you know, he was, he, he, volatile would be the word. You wouldn't actually know whether you're going to get a smile or a smack with Dad. And what did he say? This, I think Dad took it really well. Do you know what he I mean? I, I personally believe when someone says to you, I like cock, he's not knows you're going to do about it. So. <laughs> no, Dad wasn't homophobic no, at no, all. No, no, he wasn't, no. no. But I'm not too sure they knew how to handle having a gay son. It wasn't really till I decided to go and live in Birmingham with Martin and I actually said to Mum, can I leave? You know, we were cried and it was all that kind of stuff. I think that was probably the first time that she kind of accepted it. George has travelled in time, from 1971 through to 1979. I'd always kind of wanted to be loved, I would say, not famous. And I suppose I associated being famous with being loved. My relationships, I thought they were great relationships because they were really extreme and volatile. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of what love was. All my attempts to not be like my dad failed because I am basically a gay version of my dad. Soon George's trip into the past will be over. When you're forced to be in a space that's a replica, of a place where you experience lots of awful things, then you're obviously going to react strongly to that. What you learn by doing this is that, you know, some things that you thought were really awful weren't that awful. Maybe going back has allowed me to kind of say, oh, actually, you know, th there were some great times and I had great friends and, yeah, you know, I was a kid and it wasn't always awful. If I was going to take one of the items, it would be the record player. Because music was just such a big part of my life when I was a kid, you know. My life revolved around music. It was the thing that kind of kept me sane. It was a thing, it was a place that I escaped into, you know, it was a fantasy realm. So, you know, music's kind of been my salvation all through my life. So I'm going to take the record player. Goodbye. 
I'm really taking it. Back to the birth of modern dreams in a world of wannabes desperate for fame, a cultural icon emerged.